Hi everyone, welcome to Life Change Solutions webinar. Good to see you guys uh, made it here. I'm sure we're going to have a couple more people joining um, over the next few minutes, but we're going to get started. We've got a lot to get through. I'm going to hand over this now because we only have an hour and he's going to want to take an hour and a half because you know Purvis. Um, so we'll get him started as soon as possible. So over to you. Yeah, cool. Uh, thank you, Tammy. It's awesome sharing with you guys online. Uh, so just quickly behind the, our desk is Akila. Akila, thank you for all your help and support. Uh, this is a lady who's, there's a, a marriage in the family, not hers, and she's still sitting here with us today. So Akila, we really, really appreciate that. And thanks for helping us out. And Tammy, uh, thank you for uh, running with a chat box. Uh, by the way, please, the questions should just be easy questions, okay? I mean, lockdown, my mind is locking down as well. Um, th there's a song, I think it's Francois van Koch that sings the song about Die Wereld is Mal, and I must be quite honest with you that it feels to me currently as if the Wereld is Mal, uh, just people going crazy around this COVID virus, maybe with reason for some of them, but some things are just battled as mull that's my experience currently and maybe that brings me to where we want to go um for those of you that's never engaged with us before uh, life exchange solutions we started about 15 years ago and we started studying the minds of gangsters all right we wanted to figure out how do people think why do people struggle with change how do they uh, change build new thinking patterns uh, you know and and what is the effect on i mean you all know what i'm talking about right i mean 1st of January, not so long ago, you were all excited about bringing change in your life and all the things that you decided that you're going to do to bring the change in your life. Those were good things, right? And uh, how's it going, <laughs> by the way? Why do we struggle with change so much? So, so for 15 years, we've been researching change uh, from a neurological angle, but then also psychological and sociological, trying to understand how people's minds work. Now, what you might not know about Quivers, because often when I speak, it's about your thinking patterns and your mind and how to get the best out of yourself. But my passion and my desire and the heart of Life Exchange Solutions is actually, how does all of this come together collectively? In other words, it's not just about my mind. How, if I bring a lot of people together, what is the effect? when they're all together. And I think currently, this last couple of days, we, we see a strange effect, you know, when you bring a lot of people together and often the result feels like the world is mull. And so when we think about your company, um, then often you can say, Kerbis, you know what? I often wonder why people act so crazy even in our own company. Now, I think to start off with, I want to just show you a, a, a slide. And if we have ever engaged before, you would know the slide. But I just quickly want to talk you through why we need to speak about your company culture. In any company, in every company, even if you are a sole proprietor, there's people, all right? So even if you are the only person in your company, there is, there's people and companies. And the one thing that we want to do, always want to do, is we want to create or we want to cause these people to perform in a specific way. Um, now, very funny enough, you always want them to perform like you perform, right? I mean, you might only be five minutes late, but that other idiot is always 15 minutes late. What's wrong with them, you know? So it's weird. When we want to manage people, it's often, I want them to perform. At least they should perform like I perform. And now we don't get them to perform, you know. And so we've created, we've created departments to get people to, to perform. If you think about human resource management, I mean, human capital, you know, <laughs> management is let's appoint people to help people perform better. And so what we have seen over the years is that companies, they've, they've started building these systems, all right. And, and the idea is that if I can build a system that system will lead to performance. Um, and so typically, if you think about it, what we do in our companies is we say, we want our people to perform in a specific way. How will we do this? What about working hours? What about we give them the working hours eight till five, and if I can get them captured from eight to five, they will perform, right? And then people rock up at work, eight o'clock, they're there at eight, maybe a minute or two late because of a taxi or a train or something. 
Uh, and then for the next hour, they will just walk around like zombies, you know, still quickly doing a like or something on their Facebook, quickly sharing a video, making a cup of tea, and maybe quarter past nine, you will see that, okay, now they've warmed up. Now they're ready for the day. Okay, so now, now they're going to perform. And then they might work through the day, but uh, five o'clock, you do not want to stand in the door, by the way, at five o'clock because it's like a stampede. They will run over you at five. But luckily, there's a warning time. And the warning time is from four o'clock because they will start fixing their desks and cleaning everything up and preparing for tomorrow because tomorrow I'm going to work hard. And so now we say, okay, okay. It seems like the system that we have built around the hours is not getting the best out of our people. So what? Ah, what about written warnings? Let's give them some written warnings. Let's use some fear and the fear might get them going. But now HR people, you should help me a little bit. I think you can get two written warnings in six months. That means, uh, I mean, yeah, two in six months. That means it's one a quarter. It means it's four a year. It means you can burn down your business and still work at the business. If you go to the CCMA, they will still, no, 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 I mean, you need to say more written warnings. Okay, so that didn't work so well. So let's try something. Oh, how about we build a system that will appreciate our people? How about we pay thousands of rands on getting team building guys in and we will do some team building with them and a big year in function because if they feel that they are appreciated, then they will perform. And then we spend thousands of rands on people to lift their performance through showing our appreciation. And then you must see some of these people at the year function. They take little bottles and put it in the clothes and they take sweets and hide it in and kind of walk away with plates. It's crazy. And, and all that you think is like, why aren't these people performing? There is something, something wrong with them. Now, there's nothing wrong with them. The, the thing that's wrong is that we believe that we can create a system to help people perform. By the way, uh, this is just a side advertisement. Next week, uh, there will be a video out from Life Exchange Solutions on uh, uh, the difference between education and development. And we use a bit of the taxi, South African taxi scenario, so don't miss that. But, but there is this, back to this webinar, uh, there's this idea that our systems can drive performance. And if you are stuck in that thinking, I want to really help you get unstuck today and say, your system will never drive the performance of people. So what we do know, and you must understand our background is one of neurology, psychology. We understand the human mind and thinking is we know that it's not systems that drives performance, it's people's actual beliefs that drives performance. Now, uh, I'm privileged to be teaching at some universities in our country. And, and I just, you know, as I was preparing for our webinar, I was like, oh, this is such a great example. In one of the universities where I'm involved in, uh, it's a specific course, and these people are super strict about managing the, the student. I mean, you need to kind of manage a student, right? You can't just let them be because that would be chaos, right? That's the thinking. And so now what we need to do while we're managing these students is they need to attend all the classes. They can only miss two or three in the year. Otherwise, it's a fail. Uh, and we kind of create all these rules. Oh, and by the way, you need to be, you can't be late. The doors close. So if you are a minute late, you are, can't get into the class and then when you do get into the class you need to sign an attendance register and if you if there's a break time you come back you need to sign another attendance register and if there's another break time you'll need to send another attendance register and it's just all this control because we need to help these students perform but then while i'm teaching there are kids sitting in my class sleeping so they just went through every single, they, they ticked the box of every single system that's present. And then they would sit and sleep in my class. Or they would be staring at me and they will go like, uh, you know, like I'll, I'll explain something three times. And at the end they will go like, uh, can you maybe just explain this or this? I'm like, I've just explained this three times. Where were you? Because you were sitting there looking at me, but mentally they were not there. So systems, the, I mean, you can have all the systems in the world, they still sleep in the class, all right? So it's not systems that drive performance, it's the beliefs, it's, it's what people hold, the, the truth that they hold about themselves that leads to performance. Uh, and so those students that do engage, that love the class, that wants to be there, 
you can take all the systems away and they will still be there and they will still engage and they will still love the class. Does that make sense? Uh, I mean, I'm asking and you can't even respond, but um, yeah, I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, then just send me an email afterwards and I can clarify. So if we think about beliefs within companies and, and we think about how we how we can really work with people's thinking, uh, then what we have identified over the years is there are four areas that you really want to work on. And that's the personal mastery area of young people, or, or sorry, of people in your company. It's the actual company structure that will allow for belief to form. It is the kind of leadership styles that you will have have in the company that's going to allow people to de develop specific beliefs that will lead to performance and it's the social capital the social capital is like the glue that, that kind of binds people together that we regard as social capital now you can take those four points that i've listed under beliefs for you on the screen and if you take those four points and, and you just want to summarize it in one word then it will be company culture if you want to shift people's beliefs to turn out uh, to turn into great performers high thinking performers then it's all going to have to do with how you set up your company culture so if i can ask you um maybe akila just stop share quickly for me that i just see my people again um so th this is what i quickly want you to uh, let's just jump into the word culture all right let's just start with culture and uh, let me give you 20 seconds and this is going to be my question i want you to just in your own mind even if you need to write this down write down if you have to define the word culture what would it be any culture so if you have to write down an idea of this is what the culture is Quickly write that down for me. I'm going to give you a few seconds. So I'm going to just stand here and look like an idiot while you are doing this. Um, yeah, I hope you're writing down. A few more seconds. So the question is about this culture. Uh, you got something? I hope you got something. All right. I, I really want you to think about it. Now, you know, if we had a, a nice in-person, uh, you know, facilitation, then I would ask you to share with me. But most likely, when I ask people what culture is, they kind of talk about things like uh, its beliefs, its values, its its uh, often tradition comes in. People throw the word language often in, uh, and so uh, and I don't know. Maybe you've googled the word culture the last twenty seconds. I don't know. Uh, I should have actually Googled the word culture, I guess, to see what people say culture is. But the easiest way to understand culture, the, the simplest way to get the word culture is, it's the way we do things around here. That's what a culture is. It is the way we do things around here. That is the simplest way we can understand culture. Now, Quibbers, you can probably hear my accent. Um, I'm very Afrikaans. And so some people say, oh, you are part of the Afrikaans culture. And I'm like, yeah, probably. I mean, I can speak Afrikaans. I can dry a choppy. I enjoy that, you know. Um, all right, there's a lot of stuff that I like in probably stereotypically Afrikaans. It's the way we do things around here. That's just the life for me. Um, but then there is a, there's another another dynamic that you need to understand is that i also surf and and when i'm with surfers there's a culture you know on its own over there so i mean there's a there's a sense of uh you know we speak slightly differently bro i mean if it's the waves of firing and you can pull into the barrel that's pretty cool so so we've got a different culture there and then i have a, a different culture at at work uh, and so it seems like we can belong to different cultures and a culture is just the way we do things around here, the way that I just naturally do things. Now, how are we for time? Are we still good for time? Okay, cool. Because maybe I can just quickly share this with you. Um, for a long time, I was thinking about why would, why would a David Eagleman, if you ever want to read a cool book, the book's name is The Brain, and, and he explains the following. He says that when an animal is born, then what you will find is that animal, in a very uh, a couple of hours after birth, that animal will get up and be walking around and be able to eat and even communicate. But when we look at the human species, that, that like there's something wrong there because it takes 
years for some of us to really get going in life, a year or a year and a half before we can walk and talk and do a lot of complex things. And so a big question is like, why does it take us so long? What, what, what is blocking us? And it seems like that when an animal is born, they're born with some pre-wired neural pathways. And those wiring sits there to help them immediately adapt to their environment. But because humans, uh, are, you can, a, a, a baby uh, springbok, if a baby springbok is born in the Antarctic, the baby springbok will die within hours. But if a human is born in the Antarctic, it seems like because there's no pre-wiring, they quickly adapt and, and can become uh, and understand the environment. So your brain is designed to quickly adapt to environment. Uh, and when it, is, uh, when it kind of takes in the information of, oh, this is the way we do things around here, it forms the neural pathways that this is how we're going to operate. And as soon as it's formed those neural pathways, you do not have to think about it anymore. It is just naturally how you go through life. And this is where there's a little bit of a trick or a problem. Because if I am just doing things automatically and I don't think, you know, I don't think about it, then it's often very difficult to know what my culture is. Uh, if, 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 I mean, this is just normal. This is just my normal. It's just the way I do things. And so often it's so, so difficult to go like, okay, then what is my culture? Uh, I love to think that culture is like a fish that's born in water. So it's in this bowl, it's in water, and, it, and from the moment it opens its eyes, there the fish is in the water. And now I have a conversation with the fish, and I'm like, so fish, uh, what does the water feel like today? And the fish is going to go like, what's the what feel like? Now the stuff that you're in, and he's like, oh, am I in something? <laughs> I've got, oh, what are you talking about, Quivers? It makes no sense. Because all I've known my whole life, is the water that I'm swimming in. And culture is very much like that, that it's very difficult to know what your culture is. Uh, and often you need to take the fish out of the water and then, you know, the fish will go like, oh my word, I need to get back into whatever that was. Yeah, do you want to get back into your culture? Um, I was very privileged last year to spend some time in China. <laughs> that was before the whole uh, virus thing. Um, and so I was in China and it's like you walk around, you just go like, Oh my word! Like, like it's just it's just completely different. And and, and Quibus, the fish was pulled out of the out of the bowl, and I couldn't wait to come back to South Africa and just have some steak and chips and a castle light. Okay, so I was like, oh man, I just need to go back. So the one thing that you need to understand is, even in your company, there's a way you guys are doing stuff. Uh, how important is time? How excellent should work be? Uh, do you have a culture of working late? Do you have a culture of, um, you know, being very flexible? Do you, do you have a culture where you normally talk about problems or do you talk about solutions? Uh, do you have a culture where when you make your cup of tea, you talk about the idiot manager or do you have a very praising culture? Uh, and so the way you would do things in your company is like that, that fish in the water and you're just swimming around in it. And so when we talk about culture change, it often becomes very, very tricky. Like, oh man, I don't know. Uh, so because I don't know what the culture is. And so it can become very tricky. So what I want to do in the next couple of minutes, I want to share a model with you. And I want you to use this model forever. All right. So I want you to use this model when you think about your company culture. All right, so this model is not ours, by the way. It is Ken Wilber's four quadrant model. He's got the integral um, theory, and, and it's about understanding something as a whole. So according to this model, you can look at anything and understand it as a whole through looking at different perspectives. So he's got an interior perspective and then an individual perspective. Uh, he's got an exterior perspective, and um, he's got a collective perspective. Now, let me just... Do this very simple. Uh, let me just get something. Just hold on. Let me take this. Yeah. Ah, you got something here. So if I want to understand this guitar as a whole, there, there's in, interior components to this, and there's there are exterior components to this. All right. So very simple. Individual perspective, interior. You know, 
there's stuff on the inside, individual components. There's exterior components on the outside, all the strings and the scratch plate and the neck and everything. That will be exterior. But then there's also collective parts that's part of this guitar. And some of those collective parts sits on the inside. It's got a whole pickup system on the inside. And some of the collective parts is on the outside. For example, they will speak about the guitar neck, but the guitar neck has so many facets and components to it that's actually a collective, uh, a lot of individual collective. Does that make more or less sense? So um, I hope I'm not confusing more than anything else. So with this model, it is a fantastic model to start looking at your company and understanding your company as a whole. Um, so the big word is to understand the phenomenon through looking at these four different facets. All right. So let me just quickly talk you through this. Um, this is, I'll put all four quarters now. Quickly, I talk you through uh, how do you view your company or your company culture uh, through through this model. Now, in the very first place, you have people's beliefs and mindsets. That, so it's the individual person. And it's interior because you do not know what's on the inside. You do not know what their beliefs are, right? So that will be one part of your company. Now, uh, the only way that we can truly know if that what those people or what the person's belief is would be to actually look at their behavior. So now we can see the individual's exterior perspective and we can actually look at their behavior to see what do they really believe. So let me just quickly share a, a quick story for you on this. Um, that's probably a couple of years ago now. Um, I was walking, uh, I was in the Northern Cape and I was at a function, I had to do something and it became late and we were living or we were staying with hosts that, that evening um, and they were still there doing their thing and, and a colleague and myself said, hey, you know, maybe we should just walk home and then uh, you know, uh, it's not that far, maybe a kilometer away or whatever. Now, Quirbus, uh, standing in front of you, kind of grew, grew up in the Christian tradition. And so, you know, we, uh, as I grew up, I had a belief about what happens to me when I die. I mean, there's a place called heaven. And if you die, your, your body stays behind, but your soul goes to heaven. You know, so I have a lot of beliefs around that. And so this is late in the evening. This is in the Northern Cape. It's the Karoo, okay? Um, and, uh, and we are walking, so my colleague and myself, walking to the place where we need to stay that evening. We said we will just walk there, not that far. Uh, and a colleague of mine mentions that, hey, shouldn't we go through the cemetery? Because there's a big cemetery. If we should go through the cemetery, it will save us a, a couple of meters. So, you know, a, and, and, and so now I'm kind of looking at that cemetery. And, and, you know, there's all these trees standing there blowing around in the wind and, and there's literally a little metal gate creaking as it opens and closes and like, ah, and you see the tombstones kind of falling over. And I look in my mind, I'm like, real, I mean, I, I get the logic that if we walk through the cemetery, it will be, be, you know, we will save some meters, I nearly said kilometers, but not even kilometers, some meters getting to the place where we need to stay in the evening. But, but man, I don't want to walk through that cemetery in the middle of the night with the full moon you know, shining through the trees. I don't want to. And I'll never forget this moment that my colleague then kind of stopped me and said, hey, so what do you really believe? And it was such a moment that, you know, I can say things on the exterior. Oh, this is what I believe. This is what I believe. But true belief comes out through my behavior. And so it's very difficult to in, engage, to understand what the people, the interior perspective of the individual in your company, what do they really believe? But you most likely will see that through the behavior coming out. I hope that makes sense, yeah? I mean, truly, what do I believe? I'm afraid that the hand will come out of the grave as I flip and walk through that thing, okay? So that is the thing that's stuck in my heart. And so that will be my true belief. But uh, that only manifests through my behavior. Now, the same can go to when we think about company culture. I mean, what is company culture? Uh, you, we could say, oh, this is our company culture. And we can spend a lot of money to put it on the wall, the vision and the mission and, and all sorts of things. But it is only when we can actually go to um, the organizational systems and structures and stuff that we actually know what the company culture is. I mean, uh, I, I, we can say we have this lovely company culture, but how does it line up with the way you are doing things around there? I mean, that, that would be the big thing. So 
to put, put this in perspective, um, ah, here's a good one. I once uh, visit a bank, and let's not say South Africa, but it was South Africa. But anyway, so uh, I visited a bank, and um, I sat in the foyer waiting to meet with the HR person. And so there I'm sitting, waiting, and now I'm observing people coming in and out of the bank the whole time. Um, and it was fascinating because what I would see is a person will come in and then they need to put on a tag and then they need to sign in the book. And I don't know if there was a scan of the eye and then they had to do like a biometric thumb thing and then the door opened. So I'm observing people coming in and out and this tremendous, tremendous sense of security. And, and so, um, by the way, the word trust is very much part of the company's language that they use. And so I'm sitting there observing this and I'm thinking, oh, there must be a lot of money on the property. I don't understand how banks work, but clearly the vault of the bank is on this property, right? Um, and so I'm waiting there, and then it was my turn. The HR person came and said, can, you know, uh, she showed me a few things, and I got up, and I got my little tag, and I signed in, and I took a photo of my face to put it on the system, and then she had to open the door, and I walked in, and I'm just intrigued about where's the money, where's the vault, you know? I would love to see something like that. And so I asked, I said, hey, so do you keep all this bank's, the branch of this bank's money on this property? And she says, no, we actually encourage people not to have money on them, that we don't even, we, we keep our petty cash to a very small, uh, you know, uh, amount. And I'm like, then why all the security? Like, why? I, I don't get this. Like, why is it so intense? And the response was like, ah, you know, people, you know, people. I'm like, no, tell me. She says, you know, we, you need to control people. I mean, you, you can't just, you know, you, you, you know people. You know, they're going to take chances. You know people. And I'm like, but you are the HR person. You are appointing these people. Why on earth would you appoint a person that you know is going to take chances? Like, come on, it makes no sense. I thought your motto, your creed is trust. And I see no trust in this. So the point what I want to make is uh, company culture, it's interior. It's a collection of people's beliefs and mindsets, and it sits on the inside. And we don't really know what it is. And the only way that we can truly know what a company culture is, is to look on the outside and to see how do people organize themselves? Uh, what systems and structures and processes and practices do they put in place uh, to manage their people? And that will give us a very good glimpse, glimpse of what the company culture is. So, where do we change this? Where now? What do we do? Now, the very first thing, well, I said I want to give you some practical things to think about. So, the very first thing that you need to do when it comes to thinking company culture is you need to start figuring out what is the company culture that you want for your company or for your team or for wherever you're, because we can even have cultures within our teams, right? So what is, what is the culture? What is the way you want to do things naturally without thinking about it? Uh, how would that look like for your company? Now, that might be a big exercise on its own because you might really want to dig into values and all sorts of things. Um, and, and I would, ooh, I might get in a lot of trouble uh, often we get people from the outside in, you know, and they're going to help us to write a beautiful vision and a mission and our values. They can't do it for you. You need to do it for you. You need to ask the question, what would this company look like when we are achieving our goals? What would this look and feel like when we are who we said we want to be, uh, when our vision is being realized? What would it look like if, if, um, oh man, uh, um, if our teams are performing on a higher level, what would people naturally doing in this be doing in this company without thinking about it? That is the place where you need to start. And if you have that set and you kind of agree around this is the culture we want, then you now need to say, okay, okay, just to have something written on the wall is not going to bring about the culture. Just to put someone on a training course to, you know, to to better communicate, that's not going to be the change. What I need is I really need to look at the interior and exterior perspectives and see how would we need to shift that. And so maybe the very first one to look at would be that one on the right and bottom side. And the big question that you need to ask yourself is, what do I need to put in place structurally, process-wise, practice-wise, so that it lines up with the culture that we want? 
give you an example. A, a while ago, once again, trust is a big word. Integrity, we, we love these words to throw out because they sound nice. Um, and, and so I was sitting in a, in a, in a uh, and it wasn't the seminar, it was a training session. And, and they had a big chunk, this group, uh, a big part of the training was around building trust, building trust, building trust. And so the very next question, when I came up, I said, oh, I really enjoyed the session. It's amazing. Trust is so important. By the way, you guys are sitting in an open plan office. So can I ask, raise your hands, how many of you are from there? Oh, it's not going to lock your drawers anymore. And they just laughed. They said, no, I'm not I'm going to lock my drawer. You know? I don't want anyone else to come and dig in my stuff. I'm like, okay, then how does that line up with the company culture that you've just spoken about of having trust? So somehow, somehow, we need to make sure that our practices, the way we record stuff, the way we do stuff, needs to line up with company culture. If it doesn't, then you will just have this ongoing battle of we, we want to be this, we want to be this, but then we are practicing it on, on that side. I hope that makes sense to you, uh, what I'm trying to bring across. Oh, I so wish that you could just say, hey, could explain that better? Uh, but anyway, I hope that makes sense. Okay, so putting your structures in place to support the culture you want needs to be vital. If trust is your big thing, you really need to rethink security. If, if innovation is your big thing, you really need to rethink how you're going to let people present ideas to you. Uh, if leadership is your big thing, you really need to think about how will I allow people to put things in place to lead other people. You, you would really need to bring those two worlds together. Then the right top right corner, um, exterior individual one, you also want to work on that one, all right? So when we talk about role modeling from people with moral authority, is we would love to identify in the company that who will just get this and live this and can really create a picture for us as to what this should look like. Um, many years ago, we've done a lot of reading, a lot of theory about different company structures. Um, and we came around, uh, we kind of started working with self-management, uh, things, etc. cetera. Um, and we just invented our own thing. And it was, was very tricky. It was very tough to, to implement it. And then along came a guy with the name Ricardo Semler. If you have never watched his TED Talk, just go and Google Ricardo Semler, S-E-M-L-E-R. Uh, and it, I think the talk's name is How to Run a Company with Almost No Rules. And so we came across this guy, Ricardo Semler, that has already been practicing practicing it and we could start looking at how he's doing it we could start reading about how he's doing it and all of a sudden there was a role model that showed us how we can get to the company culture we really wanted and so it's great to put things in, in practice but then you need someone in your company a champion someone that's going to say okay i'm going to live this i'm going to walk with this i'm going to make sure that people can look at me and see how i put this in place um, and then the last component will be the individual interior component. And this is probably the most challenging one. But we would really need to start working with challenging people's true beliefs that sit inside of them. Not the stuff that they say they believe, but the true beliefs inside of them. Because when we can get them to start engaging in a different kind of thinking, oh man, then, then you get people like, okay, now I, I see that this, this company culture we want is not a fire in the sky dream. This is how I want to believe. This is how I want to operate. And then it's very important to kind of explore their beliefs. And by the way, there's so many tools out there that you can use. We often use reflective listening, really training people to listen well, to ask great questions, to really get to people's belief, uh, beliefs. Now, if I can work on those beliefs and I have someone that role model how this should look like and we get our, our company practices and structures in line with, with where we want to go, then the only result that is left, the, oh, there is no other result, is that your company culture will change into that high performance or positive company culture that you want. So this is not something that someone just comes and, oh, let's have a change in company culture. You literally need to look at all of those aspects to make sure that the company culture um, shifts. And one last thing, I think I'll, I'll wrap up with this, unless uh, you know, I guess we can allow for questions. But, but um, one last thing is you need to understand that these things are so interconnected that 
putting things in place will affect the role model that will affect the beliefs and the beliefs will affect the company culture, which will affect the role model, which will make sure that we have our systems in place that will affect the interior beliefs of people. So they are so interconnected. It's not like, oh, let's spin the bottle and let me choose one of these. It is you need to understand that they are very, very in interconnected. So let me just wrap this up. Your company culture is the way you do things around here. It's just without thinking, this is just what we do. All right. And uh, often we think that, hey, if we have a lot of systems and things in place, we will drive performance, but it doesn't drive performance. Uh, company culture drives performance. If you have a high performance company culture, then that is the way people will function and that's the way they will operate. And to make sure that you look at your company culture from all facets, to make sure that you address this, uh, if you want to bring about change, you really would need to get your systems to line up with that company culture. The exterior side, the role modeling needs to line up and you need to challenge people's beliefs. And most importantly, to make sure that those three line up is you really need to make sure that you understand where you want to go with your company culture. Oh, by the way, uh, I don't know, this is probably not good marketing, but um, I, I'm, just a, I'm just a facilitator. And they said, Quivers, we do webinars for free because then you sell. <laughs> so they said, you need to sell something. <laughs> okay, so, so this is what I'm going to sell then, okay? Um, I'm clearly not the salesperson. Uh, so by the way, this is what we love. This is why we get up in the morning, you know. Um, I personally am a facilitator where I love taking teams and challenging their, their beliefs and, 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 and what they do. I, I love, we've got a beautiful mentoring. Oh, and you need to watch our next webinar. But a beautiful mentoring program where we identify champions and we show them how to kind of connect with their mentees and help them to understand a, a, a high performance culture and then often we sit with companies we just look at the structure and we show them what we know works and doesn't work um, and so we we love, this is why we get up in the morning is to help companies change their cultures into a high performance culture uh, did i sell that okay is, is that a sale no okay oh you can do this on your own by the way you don't need us but uh, we can help you obviously uh, with this uh, i think that's it for me Tammy. so i don't need these questions i don't want to go on too long and then there's a lot of questions that we need to answer so can i call you back up and then yeah yeah so um i did have one or two questions that came through on the chat um so i'll just give people a little bit more time to put some more questions in now so if you've got a question if you haven't put it yet through on the chat please just add it and um and we'll start putting some of the questions i've also got some of my own questions for you so yeah and then also i mean i felt like she's man i i need people to frown and shake their heads and so on to know what they're thinking and I, i'm not getting this so I felt that every now and then I'm just like somewhere else in the world. Did this, is there anything that you feel I should just maybe clarify while people are thinking? Or will I we do that through the questions? It was pretty clear for me, okay. but um, let's see if, it, okay. if something wasn't clear, feel free to ask us to explain okay, it cool. again. Um, and we'll, you, we'll get you okay. to do it. I think also if we can get more practical examples, I think they help mm. us to understand it better. So maybe just start thinking of okay. things that you've done, what okay, we've done cool. with clients maybe to, to give an example. Yeah. Um, I see some more questions coming in, so I'm just gonna grab them. Okay, cool. Okay, so uh, first question, <clears throat> uh, Khadija, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, in your opinion, when there is a change in leadership, are there specific parameters that prompt the culture changing due to the new leader versus the office or team members maintaining in the existing culture and the new leader rather than adapts? Ooh, yeah, so, so uh, if I understand that correctly, um, fascinating because remember we are so designed to stick to what's normal and then often what we find is when we go and hate hunt a person and we bring them into our company one of two things happen and the one thing often is that this person uh, struggles to adapt to the current culture so often what happens is like i so battle i so battle to to belong in this new way of thinking this new culture that what we find is that person after six months a year or two years would leave again or what we find often is that that person just becomes like everybody else. So like we often get this leader thinking like, oh, he's going to take us to the next level. And then after a year, it's like nothing really changed. We got a new that, we got a new that, but yeah, people are still the same around here. And, and so, uh, so if that is the question, I so love the question because 
it is not just about getting a new person in the team. It's getting a person in the team that would understand as to how do I lead people into a new culture? How do we set this new culture? How do we change these dynamics to lead them there? Um, because otherwise, you might just have a leader that's just stuck in the way we do things around here, and there's no real change. Yeah. Yeah, I think that just leads me to a question that I was already thinking about in my head about the four blocks. Can you, could you just focus on one of the blocks and would that change your company culture or do you have to focus on all four? Yeah, so great question. So I think the big, the, the, the answer I want people to leave with is you actually need to change. You actually have to look at all four because what does it help that I challenge your belief, but oh, we trust you, we so trust you, and you trust, and now we trust, and we've gone through all the trust exercises, and I will catch you, and now you trust. But by the way, the system didn't change. Can you just can you just check her hand back, please? Just make sure that she didn't steal anything. And so if they don't line up, then you will have a problem. Oh, by the way, you trust, you trust, uh, we've changed the security, but we have no idea what it looks like to work in a company, so there's nobody role modeling it. So ultimately, you want all four dynamics to play along. However, you need often to just start somewhere. This could be a, a year, two year, five year thing to change the company culture. And so often you just need to start somewhere. And, it, and often just to start at a specific block will, will make a big difference. And it will maybe not bring about the big picture that you want to see in five years time, but it might just help to change things with 5%. Mm -hmm. And if we can change 5% this month and 5% next month, then come June, July, we have a lot of percents coming together to bring change. Yeah, so it's more about like the expectations of bringing a new person to a team might have a little bit of an impact, but they're not gonna change everything for you um, yeah. overnight. Ooh, but then um, I don't know if I'm allowed to to mention company names and stuff. Ah, let's do some free advertising and just shut down. Uh, there are a few people that I that I just really admire. Uh, and one guy would be like a, a Andre Labaskarni from Cabinian Mon. That he's he's a leader with a mindset on company culture is important. So once again, if you have that kind of leader, that that is going to be his role in the company is to change the culture. Oh man, you've got an awesome leader. If you have a leader coming in and my job is just to manage the person and help them to stick to the system. Ah, sorry for your operating. <laughs> okay, cool, thank you. Um, we also have a question um, from Hilda. I think if you can explain social capital a bit more. Social capital, okay, so, so Hilda, the, here's something, uh, she will explain this way better than I do. If you go onto Google and you type in um, Margaret Hetherman, I think. Are oh, you you're putting this on the chat yeah. chat box? Hetherman, Margaret Hetherman, and the TED Talk's name is um, something with a pecking order. So Margaret Hetherman, pecking order TED Talk. She has a brilliant talk on social capital. But social capital, you know, um, there was a, a a time there was a um, a world view, uh, and and people that do world view studies, they talk about an uh, orange world view or achievement world view, um, and that is where companies kind of operate like a machine. It's just a machine, you know. We just, we just, you are just a cog in the wheel. And by the way, if you're not functioning, we're going to remove you, and I'll put another one in there. And it's very much machine-like thinking. And the problem is, is people. We really start seeing people achieve a lot because I mean they're working hard and they're moving forward, but the feeling of I am just a cog in the machine really then uh, eventually got to performance because you know i why should i work this hard you know i'm i'm spending all these hours at work and not with my family and for who who's getting rich and i'm working so hard you know um, and so out of that kind of i want to say uh, unsatisfaction or dissatisfaction that people had we saw a new movement and so that new movement is called um um, pluralistic and they often talk about green or pluralistic and that is a hey we should care more about each other that if I take care of you and if I really care about your child at home that's sick and I'm going to make a plan then most likely your performance will be better as well and so that taking care of that how do we connect better how do we 
how do we make sure that you're not, you don't feel like a cog in the machine, that you feel like you're part of something bigger, uh, that you feel purposeful? Uh, all of that, they will talk about social capital. So they would say the glue that brings sticks people together in a company, that is social capital. Um, and, and why they call it social capital, by the way, is that uh, in studies, they start seeing that if I start investing in those kind of things, then it seems like our profit margins go up as well. So this is not just me wanting the team to be happy. If I can truly invest to make people connect more, then our profit margins go up. And therefore, they said the social capital investment becomes so important for companies. Yeah, I think in her TED talk, she there's actual specific yeah. numbers about like a 10% increase in profits just from 10 minutes more chatting at, at yeah. the, in the break times or something, something like that. Yeah, yeah. but watch Not the exactly TED talk. Those it's, numbers. A, it's a great TED talk to watch. Um, there's another great question that came mm. in. Um, how would these four blocks be implemented if you're alone in your business? Oh, oh. Uh, bye. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what? Uh, even when you are alone in your business, it's so important to start figuring out what is your company culture that you want. No, I mean it's just you, but what is the culture you, you want? So remember, it's just the way I do things around you, the way I do things around you. So. Am I a person that is very organized? Is that the culture that I want? Uh, do I want to, um, you know, a, a culture that my client comes first? And so if they email me within 10 minutes, I respond. So once again, you will start with what is, if your business is running successful, really successfully, what would that look like? So that's where you would start. And then a super cool activity to do is to ask yourself, okay, so now knowing what I want, what systems and processes do I need to put in place to get there? So that's number one. Number two is, is there anybody else there that I can actually just go and have a look at how they do it, how they function? How are they putting their things in place? Because I love the way they do business and I would love that to be part of my business. And so literally go to, I, I, you know, I spend time with a lot of companies um, in South Africa currently and these people are so friendly and open and you can literally walk in and say I just want to understand how you guys do business I love the way you do business and see if you can get some sort of role modeling effect and then the, the third expect that's going to sound crazy now because this is you you are the only person and you need to challenge your beliefs is to really sit and make time to challenge your own beliefs do you believe that there's enough work for all of us in South Africa? Or do you believe, oh, scarcity, you know, <laughs> let's buy all the toilet paper for just in case. And I don't, sorry, maybe that was offensive to some of you listening. You can go and buy toilet paper if there's anything left. But, but what I mean is you would really need to explore your own beliefs and see if those beliefs will line up with the culture you want. Because you can't have this culture of, excellence and and you know productivity and and positiveness if you struggle with low self-esteem if you struggle with your own value so i would literally sit with that same model think about what do i want for my business and go through all the other three blocks to make sure that they line up cool um thank you i'm just yeah i think we there's no more questions coming through in the group is there anything else you want to add yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, can I ask if is there any way that you can create a? I'm just I just want to see how people engage with this, uh, like a Google form thingy. Three questions, and we can just forward it to people. Yeah. Sure. And they can just say, "Hey, it sound was terrible, Kerbis. I see on the screen that you look very red. I can see myself. I look like I'm sunburned. So maybe the video quality is not good or something. Just get some feedback. Can we do that? You are very red, but yeah, uh, okay. yeah I've been blushing for an hour now. Uh, yeah, would you be able yeah, to? Yeah, we can. Okay. Do that. So then the only thing that I would like to add is we've been planning last year that we just want to get information out there as much as possible. Uh, we are passionate about seeing people change, seeing companies change, seeing things change. And we want to do better every time that we do this. So if we can get some feedback from you as to how we can do this better next time, I would love to see that um, so that we can just keep on feeding you all this cool stuff about how to change yourself and your own companies. Bye. <laughs> Yeah, so um, anyone who doesn't know about us, Life Exchange Solutions, if you go to our website, you can learn a lot more about us. But just specifically, we do come into your um, your business and we have neuromanagement training workshops. That's where Quirvis comes in and does a lot of fun stuff with 
um, with your people. Um, we also um, have been running mentoring programs for over 10 years now. So we really know what works, what doesn't work, how to go about designing something, how to start something, how to improve something when it comes to mentoring. And we also do some strengths coaching and development. We can do that with individuals. We can do that with teams. And um, of course, we love to get engaged in the organizational design space and just start talking about how you can make small tweaks or big tweaks to processes and structures and, and how that can really result in big changes in how your people engage in the workplace. Um, yeah, if we just go to the next thing, I think the only thing I wanted to remind you guys of is we have another webinar coming up. Uh, it's on Tuesday, the 14th of April. Um, it's going to be also on Zoom, same time, same place. And we'll be talking about coaching versus mentoring. So this is quite a interesting topic, I think, especially, I mean, this is how we began. We got very excited about mentoring as an intervention and how it can really um, grow and develop people. And then there's a, often a lot of questions when it comes to, well, coaching and mentoring, are they the same thing? Are they different? Uh, which one should I be using? What what results in what and those kind of things. So we're going to answer, um, we're going to tackle that topic and answer a lot of those questions in our next webinar. So make sure you uh, book the date today on your calendar, but you'll be getting uh, more emails to invite you to that if you're interested and we'd love to have you there and hopefully get a lot more feedback from you guys about how we can do our next webinar um, better than today's. Yeah, so that's everything from my side. Was there anything else? Oh yeah, if you want to get in touch with us, um, you can go to our website. We're always producing new content on there. We've got an awesome blog. Um, we've got email solutions at lifeofchange.co.za and you can give us a call. And if you ever just want to chat over coffee, okay, well maybe we'll have to have coffee separately over Zoom or something like that at the moment, but we're always up for that. We love to chat with people, hear what's going on in the company, figure out, where where can the change start and um, and what can be effective in kind of resolving things that are going on or just taking your company or your people to the next level and discovering you know how work could really be so um yeah so that's all from us so i'm just gonna say bye and hope to see you at the next webinar